Uh, we're here at the 2019 Muscle Car and Corvette Nationals. This year, the red carpet display is a Ford Total Performance display, and we've got a number of Boss 429s. I think we've got every color almost. And so on the other side over here, we have some Cougars and a, a Torino, and it's nice to see Ford highlighted out here this year where we've brought out this 1969 Boss 429 Mustang, uh, KK number 1213. It's the earliest known Boss 429 that had a Boss 429 engine installed in it. So they started out at 1201, and this is 1213. Um, and all those other cars either don't exist or didn't have a Boss 429 engine installed in them. The 429s had what they called car craft numbers, and this is car craft number 1213. 1213 was uh, a pre-production car that was two before the first street car, which was KK 1215, and uh, this is a special car because it is a pre-production car. It's the earliest known to exist that was a complete car. Recently, KK 1201 was uh, discovered, but uh, it was a uh, an engineering car that really didn't have didn't have as far as we know any Boss 429 modifications done to it. Which is first, the KK number or the serial number? You know, the car was built on the Dearborn assembly line, serial number wide. When it went to Carcraft, the Carcraft number was put in when it was finished, went out the door. The problem is they didn't keep them in line in track, and there was 20 of each colors done first, and the first 20 black cars were the first cars done. Well, this is the first earliest one we know of, KK number wise and serial number wise. That's a one five. All the early cars were one five zero serial numbers in the group. These cars were originally installed with a 428 Super Cobra jet engine, and that was just in the very beginning. And it was taking too long to get through the process, so they started sending them without engines. The Ford executive all came out to study and said, "We're going to. We've never done this before. We're going to ship bodies to your rollers without engine transmissions." later on and then they just put the Boss 9s in because they had these Super Cobra jet engines at the car craft plant which is right in Michigan an hour away from Detroit and they had them engines out there what are you going to do with them you know so they decided to start changing it so this has a different DSO number they're 89 2000s and there's 20 of each color for the early car and some of the unique features on it was you have to when I, he restored it I told him you have to pretend it had a Super Cobra jet engine in it and take it back out and then put the Boss 429 in. Actually, the, the car is redesigned from the firewall forward. It's unique uh, from the firewall forward. That included the shock towers, the hood, the um, fenders were rolled, and, and it wasn't just a, an easy roll. They actually put a metal rod in there and made them super tight. And the only way they could do that without distorting everything was to put the rod in there. And, a lot of people believe that Carcraft actually modified the front ends on the cars, but actually this was done um, at, at the assembly plant. They, the shock towers were installed, they're unique, but they were installed just like a 428 Cobra Jet shock tower is different than a regular Mustang. All this was, was welded together and, and assembled as um, each side was a left and a right and a core support. So it's not like uh, the guys at Carcraft started cutting and welding and modifying the shock towers. These were all stamped steel units that were actually sold separately as a replacement if you had collision damage. I documented uh, 25 things done differently on these early cars I'm studying them over the years. And it's like, the, you know, the battery was put in the trunk and the 420 Super Cobra, they had a battery up front. And so there's witness marks in the circle where they took the battery tray off. And on the back of the firewall was a hole in there. 420 Super Cobra Jet had iron heads. They grounded it to the firewall. These has aluminum heads. So they had to ground a block to the frame rail up here. So they grounded it differently up. And they also had a battery heat shield on the Super Cobra Jets on the starter motor. They, so they took that off and you'll see where the firewall, the insulation was sprayed there. Well, it's not there. They took it off, but the witness there with the marks are there yet. They had to take it off because you can't get the head to clear in there. Most of them are minor things, but you have to pretend they had a Super Cobra dead in when you store it. They had them lift hooks front and back and had a jig so they could drop it all. And they dropped it all in with the transmission all attached one time in a pit. They had a pit at Carcraft so they could go down in. There was a guy down in the pit so they could get it all done at one time. 
So when we got this car, which was uh, I think January of this year, it was uh, done up like the, the race car, it had always been. So right shortly after it was produced, it became a race car, stayed that way all of its life until just earlier this year. And, and because this was a race car all of its life, it had the, the standard interior in it because it was lighter. See, when, when the 1213 was delivered from CarCraft um, to the Ford X garage, that's where Dave Lyle picked it up and they, it was what they referred to at Ford Motor Company, a dollar car. They would, they would sell the car to Dave Lyle for a dollar and he signed a contract and then that released them from liability on the car. But they had ownership and then when they were done uh, using the car, they were supposed to sell it back to Ford for a dollar. And then uh, a lot of times the, they would make a deal where they would keep the car and then Ford would give them the title. So it was kind of a neat program, that w what they refer to as a dollar car program. I saw it in uh, Ohio when a previous owner, Gary Horton, who had it many years, was still racing it at, at the Columbus weekend. And he was running the car pretty hard yet back in the, in the 90s and uh, everybody knew what it was. It was probably a lot faster when it was originally uh, a, a super stock car when Dave Lyle had it. But when Dave Lyle had it, it was the first of the Ford uh, Boss 429s that broke the 10 second barrier. My client wanted to bring it back to, you know, as built condition. So we took, you know, a, a race car basically and converted it back into an original restored car. So in doing a car like this, um, we, you know, we have done several Fords and GMs and Mopars and whatnot, but a Boss 429 is really unlike any other kind of car. There's just so much to know, and the experts, uh, the two of them that I worked with, Ed Meyer and, and Bob Perkins, were both wonderfully helpful. Uh, photographs, descriptions, answering phone calls, um, you really couldn't jump into one of these cars and turn it around in, in 11 months and have it be really all that great at all without the help of, of those experts. Gary from Level 1, he came to the shop and looked at parts and I have a couple of unrestored cars that he took pictures of that were real low numbered cars because mine's only two away, 12, 15. Okay. And we went over some of the things that were unique to the very early cars. and. Uh, we uh, just just communicated a lot on the phone, but I mean, Level One did did all the work. I mean, they they did a great job on the car, and you know, we tried to help on some of the smaller details and some parts, but uh, Level One did did the restoration. I've helped Gary on several Boss Nine because he's more of a GM shop, and I go to Colorado, Denver area. And my wife's sister lives out there, and we go out there to visit. And I go work on the car to the shop because it's just right down the road. The, the toughest hurdle on any Boss 429 is, is just the amount of parts and the rarity of them and the cost of them. And so really acquiring the parts was a big hurdle. The car was in pretty good condition, uh, but we ended up buying a whole entire 69 Boss 429 Mustang to use as a parts car, uh, which is pretty unprecedented uh, to use one of those cars as a parts car, but we needed what we figured was enough parts to justify the cost. On this car here, the intake, uh, it's aluminum and it's an engineering piece. They're all aluminum, but this one we left unpainted and that shows that it's aluminum. And so we decided not to paint it. Uh, there is another car that they photographed uh, that was a prototype and it did not have a painted intake manifold. This intake, when it was uh, acquired, had never been painted blue. So we elected uh, to leave it natural aluminum. Um, and no one really knows for sure, but it seems to be that maybe some of these prototype cars didn't get the intake painted. Another special feature is the master cylinder and the booster. The booster is a different design. It's shorter and taller. They couldn't get the other ones to fit clear the heads up there. Well, there's an aluminum wedge adapter on the back side of that that brings it up like this so it can clear the valve covers. This is also the first car to use F60 tires. The new wide low profile tires are coming out because everybody was wanting bigger wider tire. And it's also first these 15 inch wheels. And, but the wheels are not four wheels, they're Magna 500. This is something unique too. This car was hand stamped up here. The serial numbers. Is that right? 
up here. All other cars, they're up in here. But the original cars is here, but they couldn't get into the machine to stamp it because of this outer railing up there. So apparently they started out sanding by hand. Then they, later on, Ford, they started putting the uh, thumb up there. And the reason it's got two horns over here is because old cool so they had to move one horn over and they had to have a jumper wire to jump it across up there. And they had a grounding strap on the backside to support that. And the reason the hood, everybody understand is it's a tall hood scoop. They, they were gonna be using Mercury Cougar scoop, but it's smaller. They had to have a taller because if you look across here, the way this engine was designed, it was too tall and you fit it. If you close the hood, the air cleaner actually sticks up through the hole. So that's why they made that taller scoop to get it to work up there with ram air and there are cables in there one's for as a for air and the other one is for choke because the boss lines had manual choke on them. another thing about these cars that are unique is they have a special rear sway bar it's the first american car to use a rear sway bar system because of the heavy motor up front and it's as an under axle sway bar is underneath the axle it's the first car to ever use a rear sway bar system that made up on it so that's another unique feature I would say another really nice thing about getting a parts car for this car uh, was getting a complete interior. So it's really difficult to get. Uh, the door panels are really tough to get. The seats with the comfort weave interior and even a dash pad because there's subtle differences and these judges and the experts in the Mustang field really can spot, you know, instantly spot reproduction parts. So it was really key on a car this historically important to have really the best parts and pieces. Everybody always says, you know, a, a black 429 is like the uh, most desirable color. It's the rarest color. And um, everybody that's owned the car since Dave Lyle has always had the inkling to say, what, what would that car be if we put it back stock? And then when the original motor was found, the block, you know, that's, a, that's very important on these things. And it still has the original transmission with the car. So there was enough stuff there to, to put it back to make it a Concours correct car. But it, originally the race, race history was hard to, to get over. So it's just cool both ways. And, and, and to think that the investment that was made to buy another car to get some of the, the standard boss stuff like the seats and the interior back into it, they did it the right way. You couldn't do it more more correctly I, I i think it's it's probably you know it's just a matter of opinion but uh they have the earliest known black boss 429 is pretty cool and it's a pre-production car whether it's a mustang or a hemi cuda if you've got the first one or the last one that that's always significant and uh i i just think it's good for the the hobby that the interest it's created you know either way it's it's probably got to be one of the most, if not the most significant Boss 420 Mustang that still exists. So We're going to uh, continue to, to tweak it a little bit after judging here. We'll see what the judges have to say. We'll bring it up uh, even a little bit better. And uh, hopefully we can get it out and show it at some of the other uh, Mustang events around the country.